Good afternoon or good evening, everybody. My name is Sandra Galea, and I have the privilege of serving as Dean of the Boston University School of Public Health. On behalf of our school, welcome to today's public health conversation. Before we begin, several thank yous are in order. First, thank you to our event co-host, the Society for Epidemiologic Research. I would also like to thank our epidemiology department, my home department, for their leadership in putting today together. Special thanks go to epidemiology department chair, Professor Martha Werler. And thank you to Meredith Brown and Alicia Noel, who make these events possible. These public health conversations are meant as spaces where we can come together to discuss the issues that shape health, exchange ideas, and learn from our guests and our community. This year, these conversations intersect with our school's 45th anniversary. To mark this anniversary, we have chosen to elevate the theme, public health, now is the time. Each month, we foreground a different key feature of public health. This month, we have selected epidemiology. Epidemiology, the study of health and disease in populations, is at the heart of public health. In this year of COVID, the work of epidemiology has been central to the public debate. As we have responded to a novel pathogen, an epidemiological framework has been essential to our efforts. This year has also brought new focus on race. Early in the pandemic, it became clear that communities of color are at greater risk of COVID-19. This sadly confirmed what epidemiology has long told us. Race is a key driver of health inequities. The roots of these inequities were further exposed by the killing of George Floyd last May. The national conversation that followed has been an overdue reckoning with how race shapes health in the United States. Today is the first of a three-part uh, event exploring how epidemiology can be a part of, can inform, and can learn from this conversation to help shape a healthier, more just world for everyone. I am very much looking forward to learning with all of you how we can better pursue this goal. It's now my great pleasure to turn the screen over to Professor Jay Kaufman. Professor Kaufman is president of the Society for Epidemiologic Research, a longtime friend and colleague, and today's moderator. He will introduce our panelists and moderate the Q&A. Jay, over to you. Jay, you're on mute. Thank you. Uh, great to be here. Thank you very much for the introduction and for uh, organizing this effort. It's my opportunity now to introduce the panelists that we'll hear from today. So first we'll hear from Dr. Wayne Giles. Uh, Dr. Giles became Dean of the School of Public Health at the University of Illinois at Chicago in September 2017. Prior to joining UIC, he spent 25 years at the CDC where he led the Division for Heart Disease and Stroke Prevention, the Division of Population Health, and the Division of Adult and Community Health. We will then turn to Dr. Chanel Howe, Associate Professor in the Department of Epidemiology at the Brown University School of Public Health. Dr. Howe's research interests and expertise are in study design, quantitative methods, infectious diseases, mainly HIV, and health disparities. We will then turn to hear from Dr. Sherman James, the Susan B. King Distinguished Professor Emeritus of Public Health at Duke University. In the early 1980s, Dr. James originated the John Henryism hypothesis, which posits that repeated high effort coping with social and economic adversity rooted in structural racism increases the risk for high blood pressure and related cardiometabolic diseases in black Americans, uh, especially the black working class. I also note that in 2007, Dr. James served as president of the Society for Epidemiolog Epidemiologic Research, our co-sponsor for this event and the largest professional organization of epidemiologists in North America. Um, Finally, in alphabetical order, we turn to Dr. Jennifer Manley, 
Dr. Manley is a professor of neuropsychology and neurology at the Taub Institute for Research in Alzheimer's Disease and the Aging Brain at Columbia University. Her research focuses on mechanisms of disparities in cognitive aging and Alzheimer's disease. In order to do this research, her team has partnered with the Black and Latinx communities around Columbia University in order to, uh, and, and around the country, to design and carry out investigations of social factors across the life course, such as educational opportunities, racism and discrimination, and socioeconomic status, and how these factors relate to cognition and brain health later in life. So this is the lineup for today, and each presenter will have uh, just about eight minutes to speak on this very complex topic. So now, not to waste a minute of that time, we turn to you, Dr. Giles. Hello, everyone, and it's a pleasure to be here today. I'm going to share um, my screen here. And I hope everyone can see and uh, greetings from the lovely city of Chicago, um, a city much like Boston, uh, which uh, prides itself on its communities and its neighborhoods, um, but also a city um, which has a long history of racial segregation. Um, and uh, you're seeing here the campus um, at UIC. It was actually created in the mid 1960s um, by Mayor Daley. And when the campus was created, we ended up displacing some residents, largely uh, residents in black and, and brown communities. So that's part of our, our history. Um, as, as I think about sort of the work uh, that I'm gonna talk about in the next 10 minutes or eight to 10 minutes or so, I've got some major themes. And as was mentioned in the, in the intro, I spent about 20 plus years at the CDC, I'm running a bunch of surveillance systems and other things. So one of the things that got drummed into my head by Dr. Janet Collins, who was the director at uh, the Chronic Disease Center was what gets measured is what gets done. So I wanna talk about that talking about sort of examination at looking at subgroups, getting much more granular. I think this is really not much, this is not as much about race as it is about racism and impacts of racism. So I wanna talk about that and then wanna end up talking about sort of structural and community determinants of health. I wanna start off just acknowledging um, one, a book that I keep on my desk and look at periodically and a lot of our MPH students uh, delve into um, when they come into the school. Um, and that's W.E.B. Du Bois's Philadelphia Negro, which was published uh, in 1899. He did this when he was on sabbatical from Wilberforce University and came to Penn. And it really is the first time that anyone did a systematic review of a non-white population in the United States. And I think it's, <clears throat> it's sobering for us to think about when you read uh, what W. D. B. Du Bois wrote uh, back in the 1890s, it is striking to me <clears throat> the fact that <clears throat> the fact <clears throat> excuse me the fact that uh, many of the issues that he talked about then we're still talking about today. So poverty, unemployment, housing segregation, impacts of racism. A lot of those we're still talking about. I know later in the week you're going to talk about are we making progress. Um, but that to me is particularly sobering. In terms of what gets measured, <clears throat> this is from a project that we've got um, a community outreach intervention project on the west side of Chicago, which is a harm reduction program. Uh, these are slides from April of last year. Uh, and you'll note people are congregating uh, early in the COVID pandemic. And as we were doing our street outreach work, um, we were one, you know, we were wondering what the rates of COVID were in the city and for the state. And so I sent a series of emails to our colleagues, both the city health department and the state health department. And they said, well, we don't have data on that yet. We don't have a lot of confidence in it with our data. And so with a little bit of coaxing, was able to get some data uh, for uh, for the city of Chicago, and you'll note that in early May, we were noting 40% of the cases were in Latinx, 30% African Americans. But I also want you to note that 24% of the cases had missing data. And I want you to remember that number because I'm going to come back to it um, at the end of my presentation. But again, I think it's important that we remember what gets measured, what is what gets done. We need to have this data. We need to have it not just at the state and the local level, but at the national level as well. 
when, when, when um, Tom Frieden was director of CDC, he created a series of vital signs. Um, these were publications in the MMWR. Um, one of them um, back in 2015 um, was the first one to look at Hispanic uh, lifestyles and, and, and life factors, um, and really was the first time in CDC's history that we had looked at Hispanic subgroups and nicely shows, uh, and importantly shows the variation that we see by Hispanic subgroups. And I think uh, illustrates sort of the importance of us getting more granular um, in terms of the work we do and being able to look not just at the large race ethnic groups, but looking at smaller groups as well. Uh, <clears throat> this is another really important vital signs that came out. This is from uh, epidemiologist Dr. Tim Cunningham, um, one of my last publications at CDC with him, um, really looking at the age race interaction in terms of life expectancy between blacks and whites. Um, and you'll note that among people over the age of 65, um, he noted that that disparity that we had seen um, in the late 1990s and, and prior to that basically disappeared um, by 2015, 2016. Um, you'll note though that among the younger age groups, we still see that, real, that, um, that, that disparity um, between blacks and whites. I think one of the things that would be interested in the area of COVID is what has happened to this black white disparity in more recent years, because my guess is we're now because of COVID seeing excess mortality in, even in, in these older age groups. And I think that's part of the impact. So when he, when he looked as part of this work, he looked at sort of what, where the declines were, why we saw improvements in health in the older age groups and found it was largely due to improvements, I think in the treatment prevention and control of heart disease um, and cancer as well. But the other thing he, he noted was he also wanted to look at what was happening in the younger age groups and found much higher rates of unemployment, living in poverty, uh, lack of wealth in younger persons compared uh, uh, in, in younger blacks compared to the white counterparts. But again, much like what W.E.B. Du Bois talked about in the 1890s, getting at some of these structural determinants that can have a huge impact on health and well-being. I want to pivot now and talk a little bit about measuring impact on race. Um, and this is some of Kamara Jones's work that she did when she was at CDC, looking and creating a module for the BRFS that we uh, called the Reactions to Race module, but really is very much about sort of how do we measure race, uh, or, or rather the impacts of racism in our surveillance system. And this module looked at both self-identified race, but also socially assigned race. And I'll talk about that in a little bit more depth in just a minute. But it also asked people questions about how often do they think about their race? Do they feel they were treated uh, the worst, same, or better than people of other races? When seeking health care, did they experience worse, same, or better outcomes? Did they experience physical symptoms? Did they feel emotionally upset, angry, or frustrated based on the way they were treated? And this is uh, from a publication of Dr. Jones's in Ethnicity and Disease that looks at this issue of individually identified and socially assigned race. And I'll just go across the top relatively quickly. But if you look at Hispanic, the Hispanic populations, people who self-identify as Hispanic and socially uh, are assigned Hispanic they have lower health-related quality of life than people who self-identify as Hispanic and socially identify as white or individuals who self-identify as white and are socially assigned as white. If you look in the Native American population, those who self-identify as American Indian and socially identify or socially identified as American Indian have less health-related quality of life than those who are socially assigned white. And then finally, those individuals who say they're of more than one race um, and, self, and socially identify as black have lower um, health-related quality of life than those who are socially identified as white. So gets at the concept of white privilege. The last item that I wanted to talk about is within uh, the School of Public Health, we've created a 
population health analytics metrics and evaluation or fame center uh, within the School of Public Health. And there we house um, the Chicago Health Atlas. This is a survey that's done by the health department and uh, looks at 77 neighborhoods across the city of Chicago, but helps us to get more granular um, in terms of our data. And one of the uh, uh, PIs for the Fame Center is Dr. Sage Kim, um, who's been looking at some more recent COVID data. Um, and these are data from last week, and you'll know 35% of the cases are um, in this, the Latinx community. If you look at deaths, higher rates in the Black and Latinx community. But I also want you to note that even as of last week, about 23% of the cases had missing data for race, ethnicity. So not much progress that we've made on that front. This shows you the city of Chicago by the different neighborhoods and, you know, and the, where the Latinx and black communities uh, reside. And you'll note they reside mostly on the west and southern um, parts of the city. If we look at poverty, again, where we see higher rates of poverty is really in those same communities as well. And then if we look at sort of where we see the highest rates of COVID, here looking at COVID mortality, but we could look at positivity rates, cases of COVID, et cetera, we'd see basically the same communities over and over again. But I would argue it's not just about COVID, but if we look at heart disease, obesity, diabetes, smoking, hypertension, we see all basically the same trends and the same communities over and over again. Um, and the last thing I want to uh, show with you all is um, what's happened in the city of Chicago in terms of racial segregation between 1960 and 2010, so basically over the last 50, 60 years or so. And you'll note we've become increasingly racially segregated over that time. And I would argue it's that level of racial segregation, those structural community determinants that cause higher rates of poverty, et cetera, that's leading to those higher rates of smoking, obesity, diabetes, heart disease, and COVID, and, and all of this is related as we move forward. So a lot of the things that Du Bois talked about back in 1899. So with that, I want to say thank you very much. It's a pleasure to talk with you, and uh, I'll turn things over again to Dr. Kaufman. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Uh, we uh, move on now to the next speaker, um, who is uh, Dr. Howe. All right, great, all set. Let's see. Just want to set up my screen properly. All right, great. Um, so, good evening, everyone. Thank you so much to BU and SCR for inviting me to participate in such an important and timely panel. As mentioned, my name is Chanel Howe and I am an Associate Professor of Epidemiology at the Brown University School of Public Health. For the last decade, my work has been at the, in the areas of methods, health disparities, and infectious diseases. I was asked to briefly provide comments during this panel regarding how best to study etiology and epidemiologic studies on race and health. So in about eight minutes or less, here are my thoughts and recommendations for studying racial health disparities. However, before providing those thoughts, I just wanted to briefly acknowledge that these thoughts and recommendations were informed not only by my own prior work, but the groundbreaking work of so many others. Um, and I've listed a few of uh, these uh, scholars here on this slide, as well as the next slide. So in terms of my thoughts, first, I believe that theory matters and history matters. For example, to validly identify pathways that contribute to US racial health disparities, I think we need theoretical frameworks that are grounded in US history and rigorous scholarship. 
Grounding our theories in US history and rigorous scholarship should help researchers to avoid treating race as an innate and immutable biological characteristic of an individual in their studies of US populations. And hopefully instead lead researchers to treat race in a way that more accurately reflects, reflects history. Specifically reflects race as a social grouping that captures disadvantage and privilege and was created to help justify the oppression and marginalization of particular groups. The creation of racial groups is depicted in this infographic provided by the Pew Research Center that shows how racial groups were recorded as free whites versus all other free whites versus slaves during the nation's first census in 1790. Note that the all other free persons and slaves group largely eventually became the modern day black or African-American racial group. Second, I believe that having good data matters and understanding the source of those data matter. By good data, I mean data that are one, mostly complete. For example, data that have minimal missing values. Two, have minimal measurement error. And three, capture important information such as exposures to racist policies and discrimination. And, I, and when I say understanding the source of those data matter, I mean, for example, determining how racial group membership was captured. For instance, was racial group membership captured directly from the participant using a survey? Or was it captured from the participant via verbal communication to a study staff member? Or was it um, captured through someone else's perception? I think knowing the answers to these questions can provide important insights regarding the degree to which our data are subject to measurement error and how best to interpret our study findings, given that findings may depend on whether racial group membership captures self-identification or perception. Third, I think that being clear matters. When I say clear, I mean being clear not only about what race is capturing, but also being clear about mechanisms. For example, if you believe that an observed association between race and a health outcome is due to racism, then to validly study pathways contributing to the observed association, I believe it's necessary to articulate what you mean by racism. For instance, do you mean structural racism, interpersonal racism, internalized racism, or all of the above? If you believe that the observed association is due to structural racism, well, structural racism during what time period? For example, structural racism from 100 years ago, during the Jim Crow era, or structural racism in the last decade? I think being clear about what we mean will hopefully force us to next question whether we have the good data necessary to validly study etiology. So for instance, if you believe that a racial disparity is due to racist policies such as Jim Crow laws that legalize racial segregation, then to validly study etiology, you may need indicators of varying exposure to Jim Crow laws, like in the work presented here from 2017 by Dr. Dr. Nancy Krieger and colleagues. This work indicates, sorry, this work indicates that Jim Crow laws may have contributed to observe racial disparities in estrogen receptor negative breast cancer tumors which tend to, have poor, tend to have a poor prognosis than estrogen receptor positive tumors. Specifically, this work showed that Jim Crow birthplace was associated with an increased odds of estrogen receptor negative breast cancer among black women born before 1965 when Jim Crow laws were still legal. However, Jim Crow birthplace was not associated with an increased odds of estrogen receptor negative breast cancer among white women. This work also showed that black versus white the black versus white odds ratio for estrogen receptor negative breast cancer was higher among women born in Jim Crow versus non-Jim Crow states. Fourth, although using causal diagram to depict our theoretical framework when studying racial health disparities can be challenging, I do think that causal diagrams can still help us to be clear about race, clear about racism, and clear about the relative, relevant mechanisms. Causal diagrams can also help to identify whether some portion of the observed racial disparity is due to our design or analyses. For instance, because a collider was conditioned on. If for some portion of the race, if some portion of the racial disparity is in fact due to our design or analysis, then this realization can hopefully prompt us to consider whether we want to only isolate the portion of the observed disparity that is due to causal mechanisms when reporting the magnitude of a disparity, because that portion, the portion that is due to causal mechanisms rather than the design or analysis may be the only portion that we can expect to reduce via interventions. Fifth, I think that both race and racism should be included in our theoretical model, for example, our causal diagrams. 
I make this suggestion based on recent statements I've heard that seem to imply that we should exclusively just be talking about racism. I 100% agree that racism is a root cause of racial health disparities. However, to identify effective interventions to reduce these disparities, it's likely helpful to depict or describe in our theoretical models how race is associated with the outcome. And as other researchers and scholars have noted, we need to continue to collect data by race to be able to monitor racial disparities over time and not only collect data on racism. So those are my thoughts and recommendations. I'm happy to elaborate on these ideas as well as other topics or concerns during the discussion portion of today's panel. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Howe. Uh, it's amazing, a year into this pandemic, we're still fumbling around trying to mute ourselves and unmute ourselves, turn our videos on and off. It's still uh, get, taking some getting used to. I feel like as soon as I figure out the Zoom environment, we're not gonna use Zoom anymore and we'll be back hopefully face to face again. Um, thanks very much for those comments. Uh, we can turn now to our next speaker, Dr. James. Trying to get uh, trying to get the slide. Here we go. Okay. Can you see that? Yes. Okay. Good afternoon, uh, everyone. Okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me to be a part of of uh, the panel today. So I'm going to um, divide my comments into two parts. Uh, the, first, the first set of comments will um, address the issue of why study racial health disparities. And then I'll share some comments on how we study racial health disparities. So to begin, when he was campaigning for the US presidency in 1859, Abraham Lincoln often spoke of America as a place where initially poor, honest, but industrious individuals could improve their condition through steady, honest labor. In Lincoln's view, human nature is entitled to such improvement. And the most important role of government, he said, was to secure the conditions whereby this improvement could occur. Although Lincoln was thinking of white Americans when he said this, and not of the people indigenous to this country, and certainly not the enslaved millions of black people that it took a civil war to free, this particular idea of America as a place where human beings could flourish has been a magnet attracting people from all over the world, despite all persistent difficulties to make the idea itself a reality. So regarding the question, why study racial health disparities? I was struck by the complementarity of Lincoln's view of the major role of government, namely secure the conditions for human improvement, and the frequently quoted statement about the mission of public health as set forth in a memorable 1988 report by the Institute of Medicine titled, The Future of Public Health. Our mission, the report asserted, is to fulfill society's interest in assuring the conditions in which people can be healthy. Human improvement obviously depends on improvements in human health. And this seemingly puts the mission of public health, if we agree with Lincoln, at the very center of America's democracy project. Our public health mission is fulfilled, the report continued, by applying scientific and technical knowledge to prevent disease and promote health. As current events attest, this scientific and technical knowledge is provided for the most part 
by the science of epidemiology. And it follows, therefore, that whenever and wherever glaring racial disparities in health exist, our mission as the diagnostic science of public health requires that we do our best to identify their causes wherever the science might lead us. How we study racial health disparities. I propose that there are three main perspectives that characterize how we study racial health disparities. Major differences include their relative emphasis on individual group or spatial determinants of the disparities and the explicit emphasis each tends to place on enduring differences between whites and marginalized racial minorities in their material life conditions as distinct from enduring racial differences in political and economic power. First, the individual level perspective. Here, race refers to membership in one of the standard racial categories of the US Census. And the primary research question tends to be, do higher levels of perceived exposure to everyday or lifetime discrimination by, for example, Black Americans predict their increased risk for disease independent of well-established socioeconomic and health behavior risk factors. This perspective represented a major paradigm shift in racial health disparities research when it first appeared in the mid-1990s. Second, the structural racism perspective. Here, race is less about risk associated with one's personal characteristics and health behaviors that a marker of how easy or difficult it is for individuals to access basic goods and services to support healthy living as a function of where they live, work, study, or play. Public policies that facilitate relatively easy access to such goods and services for whites, but limit access for racial minorities create conditions of structural racism. Hence, a common research question might be, does greater exposure of Black Americans to high levels of residential segregation, a well-known example of structural racism, help explain Black-white racial disparities and risk for certain health outcomes? And is this the case after controlling for known individual level risk factors? This is another important paradigm shift in how we study racial health disparities. Third, the power differential perspective. This perspective assumes that both structural racism and the racial health disparities it presumably causes exists because racial elites, whites in the US, use their group, not their individual, power to enact policies that protect their privileged access to valued health promoting resources. And they do so at the expense of marginalized racial minorities. The most compelling example of the power differential perspective of racial health disparities, I think, is Lincoln Phelan's theory of the fundamental social causes of disease. Briefly, Lincoln Phelan argued that health disparities by both socioeconomic status and race persist over time, whether the leading cause of death is tuberculosis, heart disease, or novel coronavirus. Because socioeconomic and racial elites use their money, knowledge, power, prestige, and beneficial social connections in flexible ways to protect their health and well-being, something non-elites cannot do. This is an elegant theory, and there is empirical research to support it. The theory helps us to understand why it is so difficult to substantially narrow or close the US racial health disparities gap. That said, I think a case can be made 
that money, knowledge, prestige, and beneficial social connections play a different role than power in fueling racial health disparities. That power is actually the end result, the real goal of having money, knowledge, prestige, and beneficial social connections. My next and last slide makes this point schematically. If Lincoln, Phil, and I correct, and I believe they are, then we epidemiologists should take much more seriously the question of how inequitable power differentials between whites and racial minorities create and maintain racial health disparities across time, place, and leading causes of death. Doing so will require expanding our interdisciplinary research teams to include researchers who study how large excessive racial group differentials in power undermine core democratic values, including efforts to achieve health equity in an increasingly diverse multiracial society. Thank you very much, Dr. James. Fantastic. And now we move to our final presenter, Dr. Manley. Thank you. And I uh, believe you're seeing my slides now. Uh, I'm truly honored to take part in this discussion and um, I am cursing the alphabet that made me follow Dr. Sherman James in the order of, of speakers today. Um, my basic bottom line is that the reason that I study race is because there are racial inequalities in Alzheimer's disease and related dementias, ADRD, um, and brain health, and I'm working to eliminate those health inequalities. Here's some of the partners that I have in this work at Columbia University and the grants that fund the research. Uh, that I do and I wanna thank them and the participants uh, first off today. And here's where I work. Um, this is Washington Heights in Northern Manhattan. And uh, if you're familiar with that neighborhood, you know it's a very um, uh, vibrant and diverse place. Um, we have been partnering with the residents of Washington Heights for almost 30 years following a uh, representative group of older adults that were recruited because they were eligible for Medicare um, uh, they reside in the census tracts around the Columbia University Medical Center. All of our research team are bilingual in Spanish and English. And prior to COVID, um, um, we uh, did our research visits in uh, primarily as, as home visits. So participants were not required to come into the hospital to take part in this study. Um, originally published in 1991, the key finding from this YCAP study persists to this day and is updated, um, uh, being updated now by Wei Ming Watson. Um, and the data show that among people who were cognitively normal at their first visit at baseline, um, Latinx and non-Latinx um, uh, black participants had a higher risk of developing dementia and Alzheimer's disease at a subsequent follow-up visit um, they were at higher risk for incident dementia than non-Latinx white participants. Um, this inequality is not mediated by uh, uh, cardiovascular disease um, like hypertension or diabetes or stroke or um, traditional measures of adult socioeconomic status like years of school, occupational level or income. It's not just Washington Heights. Uh, these data are from Elizabeth Rose Maeda and the Kaiser Permanente Northern California study, um, which uh, showed that um, uh, in Northern California, um, uh, Asian Americans were the least likely to develop dementia over time. And uh, therefore they were set as the reference group in the study. Uh, Dr. Maeda found that African-Americans were 65% more likely to develop dementia than Asian-Americans. And uh, um, 
American India, Indian and Alaska Native participants were 32% more likely to develop dementia than Asian Americans. Again, this, these results were not explained by cardiovascular disease. So um, we find repeatedly in, in over these epidemiologic studies that black people are at higher risk to, uh, for dementia than white people, but um, regardless of race, people who were born and raised in stroke belt states are at higher risk of dementia. Um, as shown by Maria Gleemore in the study of um, dementia related mortality, um, I just wanna emphasize that the state level data here uh, where the darker states are the ones with um, higher risk of, of having um, dementia related mortality, um, the, the states here are state of birth, not state of death. Um, and a lot of people moved and we had the great migration from Southern states to Northern states. So you take your childhood risk with you. Why are the stroke belt states being um, uh, emphasized here? Um, recent work, and this was mentioned by an earlier speaker, has linked county level historical measures of the impact of slavery, lynching, Jim Crow laws, and neighborhood measures of redlining as indicators of policy-driven violence and social control that have been linked to mortality and other health outcomes. In other words, people living in places with greater leg legacies of racial violence have worse brain health, and this affects both black and white people. These data are using the Health and Retirement Survey, a national uh, population representative sample of people age 50 and older in the US. The dots um, and error bars within each of these panels are hazard ratios and associated 95% um, confidence intervals comparing incident of dementia in non-Latinx uh, black participants to the incidence of dementia in non-Latinx white participants where the white participants are the reference group. The two figures just show different methods of calculating whether people have dementia in the HRS. Um, and so this, this is a stubbornly um, uh, uh, large and unchanging over time disparity. What you're not seeing is that overall, the incidence rates of dementia are going um, down over time. That's good, but the, the disparities are staying the same. Moving to other potential mediators of the racial disparities in dementia. This is work from my colleague, Adam Brickman, who's been uh, doing um, structural MRI images of people in the YCAP study. And he quantifies white matter hyperintensities. This is um, damage to the white matter of the brain. Um, uh, he finds that um, uh, among the non-Hispanic white people in the uh, YCAP cohort, these white matter hyperintensities are not related to cognition. Um, where, however, the white matter hyperintensities are related to uh, cognitive impairment and cognitive decline over time in the non-Hispanic black participants in the uh, study. In contrast, um, uh, hippocampal volume uh, he's studying that uh, hippocampus structure of the brain. He finds that among the non-Hispanic white people, uh, folks who have a smaller hippocampus are at higher risk of developing dementia at follow-up, whereas this is not the case among the non-Hispanic black people in the study. Other biomarkers of neurodegeneration um, that are, uh, this is a very high profile study from a group in St. Louis. John Morris showed no differences across race in white matter hyperintensities and amyloid, but black participants had lower tau. Um, that's on the right side of this figure. It led these researchers to suggest that there are race dependent biological mechanisms that contribute to the expression of Alzheimer's disease. Um, but you'd never know uh, about these disparities from clinic based studies. And uh, that's really where most of the research on Alzheimer's disease is taking place. Um, this is because um, recruitment takes place in specialized clinics like memory disorder centers, which are traditionally housed in neurology or psychiatry clinics. These investigators and departments have done very little traditionally to engage with communities who are bearing most of the burden of cognitive impairment and dementia, and, and therefore our uh, research field has not yet earned their trust. Um, um, I just want to point out that um, uh, the concern therefore in many of these studies 
that recruit from clinical settings is that um, uh, uh, enrollment factors lead to bias in these studies. I think a really good example of this is going back to the YCAP sample, that's our community-based cohort. Um, levels of amyloid and tau uh, in our study were not at all different across race and ethnicity. Um, and that's what this figure is showing. Just incidentally, um, tau um, uh, levels in the blood, in plasma, were a good predictor of uh, neuropathological um, evidence of Alzheimer's disease in that study. So uh, uh, what I wanna bring up is that to understand mechanisms that underlie racial inequalities, you have to understand who is in your research study and how that might bias your results. Um, these are study uh, results from uh, Laura Zahadny who looked at the Midas study and YCAP and found that um, as people aged in the study, uh, disparities in cognitive impairment narrowed over time. And this is known as age as, as leveler effect and is due to survival bias. Um, as a, um, a, a, a response to that, uh, one of our postdocs, Indira Attorney, looked at a younger generation of people um, who are um, the adult offspring of the Washington Heights cohort and found um, that uh, as, as um, most studies do, the um, black and Hispanic people in our research study had more uh, white matter hyperintensities, this white matter damage in the brain than did whites, but that the uh, disparity was widest in the younger generation, the offspring generation. And finally, um, Maria Gleemore, Audrey Merchland, and I are uh, working up this, this result in the REGARDS cohort, that's a national cohort, uh, where we looked at investment in school quality in the counties and states where people lived when they were children and found that higher investment in elementary school was associated with lower risk of cognitive impairment later in life. The effect was strongest in whites, especially white women, I just wanna um, note that the benefit of school quality was much lower among black people in general, especially black men. We think that racism in schools and the labor market and throughout life uh, counteract the benefits of, school, of high, higher quality schooling for black Americans, particularly for black men. So I agree with others on the panel that our theoretical framework shapes the questions that we ask and our methodological approach, racism, um, is in the pathway between uh, uh, racial self-identification and, uh, and cognitive decline in Alzheimer's disease. Um, uh, and there are many other social factors in this pathway. I think that races, uh, I agree that race is made biological through racism and uh, Kamara Jones's Gardner's Tale gives us a very helpful framework for thinking about that for Alzheimer's disease research. So I'm gonna stop. Um, by saying that the reason that I study race is to name, um, describe, and measure the ways that structural racism harms brain health um, in order to dismantle it. And this is uh, sort of a summary slide of how I study race and later life brain health. Um, we need to conduct our research in the community, um, not in clinic-based um, uh, research studies in order to um, understand the mechanisms of disparities. That involves um, equal partnerships with um, the community and a support for, um, for, the, for, for the community as they, as they um, direct us. Um, some of these community-based partnerships have led to really innovative work. Um, uh, I, I, sh I showed you some of the work that we have on um, school quality and literacy, um, but um, it, and also looking younger in the age uh, range, younger than 65 to study dementia um, disparities, but also some really innovative um, brain health interventions that are rooted in the principles of black joy. Um, Raina Croft and Julian Johnson have um, great examples of that research and we can talk about it later. And then finally, um, th this kind of research demands that we ask better questions, that we change the people who conduct um, this research, we change the places, we transform the places where the research takes place um, to clarify um, how race and ethnicity are being defined and used and identify studies 
um, that are reifying race as a biological difference and uh, determine exactly who benefits from that type of research. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Manley. Well, we've gone through all of the brief presentations from the speakers, and now it's time to have a discussion between the speakers and with the questions from the audience. I was worried coming in that we might not get questions, but in fact, we have quite a few that have already lined up in the queue. Uh, so now the task is really the difficult one of sorting through these and trying to find the themes that we have an opportunity to discuss. Um, so I, I'm just, uh, as I sort through these things and, and try to make sense of the, the different questions and how to group them and how to think about the underlying themes, I'll just try to ask these of the, uh, the panelists and uh, you all can speak up uh, in any order that you wish, or someone can decide to take on a question, or uh, uh, they're not, most of the questions are not directed to any specific speaker. Um, so let me start with uh, one set of questions that have arisen in the, in the chat here. A number of people have written in about different groups. Um, someone wrote in to ask about the different Hispanic groups and how they should be handled. Someone wrote in and said, how come nobody's talking about Aboriginal Americans, uh, Indigenous Americans? Um, how, how do we prioritize groups? Who should we be studying as minority groups in the United States or disadvantaged groups? How do we define uh, the number of groups and the, the granularity of those groups that we should be discussing? What's our organizing principle for deciding who's in and who's out and, and where our focus should be and how, which group is getting enough attention or which group is getting too much attention? Don't all talk at once. Yeah, no, I, I, I can start and others can chime in. I mean, you know, I, I think these are all sort of really important questions. And, and I think part of, you know, what we were trying to do is get much more granular with our data and being able to look at some of these nuances. I mean, I think that's why I, I wanted to present some of the um, uh, vital signs work uh, that was done during my tenure at CDC, just because I do think we tend to lump groups. And so I, I think we're missing some of the intric intricacies and, and some of the, the differences that we see within. Now, having said that, I think we need to make sure we've got adequate sample size and all of that other really important aspects of that work. But I, I you know, I am always struck by sort of the, the differences um, that we see when we look uh, within subgroups. And I think we see that also um, in terms of geography and pe where people come from as well. Um, so I just, you know, I think as much as we can do that, I, I think uh, that's the strength that we have. But those are my thoughts. Yeah, there's, there's some potential, um, uh, what's the word, uh, like harm that's done to communities by grouping them all together, right? Like uh, here in Canada, we have a large number of Aboriginal groups that are the focus of disparities work, uh, but we tend to collect them for sample size reasons into groups that are not really related to each other in any culturally meaningful way, uh, but are a convenience for the analyst. Is that a danger that we that we have as epidemiologists that we, we disrespect the, the groups by collecting them together in ways that are not meaningful to them? I agree completely. I think that um, I really appreciate Dr. Howe. I think, um, uh, uh, you know, her, well, overall her emphasis on measurement and, um, you know, what we, what we measure is, is um, what we, what, you know, really leads to our knowledge. Um, you know, I, I think that um, we were also shown um, a, a, uh, you know, a, a module uh, that was developed by Dr. Jones um, on how other, you know, asking people to report how other people view them racially. And uh, that's an incredible variable where I work at, in, uh, important variable where I work in Washington Heights where there's a large uh, Afro Latinx um, group. And we're starting now to disaggregate the, um, the uh, Dominican, Puerto Rican, Cuban, mainly immigrant um, uh, groups there uh, in that respect, um, because I think that, um, you know, we, we are doing a disservice to not collecting those data. Um, again, um, in, embedded community-based research will help us understand how people identify themselves. 
um, and and what, what what some of those those subgroups really are. Uh, just quickly, I want to add in national studies, we need to oversample these groups. Otherwise, we'll never get at the uh, you know a kind of power to answer some of the questions that we that we have. Thank you. Uh, another series of questions that arose were about the reaction to Dr. Giles talk about the missingness in the data. Uh, we have seen several people note uh, that over the course of the pandemic that a large number of the data points are missing ethnicity and race. Um, the questions were about what accounts for this missingness. Um, is it the case that people are uncomfortable with categories and choose not to respond? Or is it the case that the data collection is being done in a sloppy way that leaves those uh, empty because data collectors are not that focused on it, not interested in it? Um, how, how do we uh, avoid this problem? And then uh, another set of questions was about how we deal with this if we're analyzing the data. We have this large proportion that's missing. How analytically we can handle that. So, I mean, I can start off and then others can chime in as well. I, I think part of this was the, these, the cases data came from the, the testing data that we were doing across the city. And, and so for many of the providers who were um, conducting the testing, they simply were not asking the question. And that was sort of what was happening with about 25%. And I think that that has continued um, until, until today as I, I showed in that. And, and so I think both um, for folks who are doing the testing or whatever, but I think also within our healthcare systems as well, you know, the, the, the quality of the race ethnicity data tends to be pretty uh, limited. And so I think thinking about sort of how can, we can reinforce with them sort of the importance and the value of collecting um, that data, I think is vitally important. Because, um, you know, as I said, it, it sort of helps us to understand sort of what's happening. And I think making sure also as part of our messaging that people understand the value and the importance of sort of why we collect the data that we collect. Okay, um, a number of other questions were about the distinction that some speakers raised. Uh, Jay, I think, oh, yes. um, can I just say one additional um, comment in response to your missing data question? Please. So I mostly or often work with data from like electronic health data. So from, you know, HIV clinic cohorts and usually those data are complete, but they can be missing. And um, there was a study I think that came out a couple of years ago that looked at this in terms of electronic health records. And so what was insightful from that was the fact that, um, you know, how the data ends up in the medical record, oftentimes um, it could be a patient uh, fills out a, you know, intake survey, or it could be a clinic staff member asking a patient what their race ethnicity is. And a patient may not be comfortable sharing that with the provider because they may think that the provider is going to use that to treat them differently and may decline. And so having that sort of contextual information is really helpful when you are analyzing the data in terms of thinking about the potential sources of missingness. And that paper um, indicated that perhaps just getting the data through surveys versus having the participant communicate that to um, someone else could actually help to minimize um, the missingness of the data. Excellent, thank you. Um, a number of people asked for a little bit of help with the oper operationalization of this distinction that the speakers raised about measuring racism. Uh, they expressed some frustration about finding data sets in which there's simply a race variable that asks people to self-declare that they belong in one box or another. How does one study racism in such a data set and how, how do we improve data collection so that we can study that concept more helpfully and more fruitfully? So I think, um, I think that a window has been opened uh, over the last year or so, uh, whereby uh, new kinds of information, new kinds of data can be collected about the role of systemic racism uh, as, a driver, as a driver of racial health disparities. Um, it took the unfortunate events, you know, of, of the, um, the police killings of, of unarmed black people uh, to begin to raise the awareness of the scientific community. And the, dis the disparate impact of the pandemic on black and brown people, you know, further um, 
underscored uh, the importance of, of, of structural racism and, this, and the different manifestations of it. And, um, and so I think that we have, at least I would like to believe that as a scientific community, and I'm now thinking across the sciences, uh, not just public health, but, but medicine. Um, and, and you see it in terms of, you know, the various journals published by the American Heart Association or the New England Journal of Medicine. You, you see it, people, people are now awake, they're concerned. And, and NIH, NIH is also concerned, you know, that the right kinds of questions have not, have not been asked. Um, and so I think that it will, become, it will become easier now to get uh, some of the information that we need about racism and what it is, how it works, how it compromises the health of people in some of our national health surveys and in Haynes, I'm talking about. Uh, the CDC as, you know, as Dr. Giles you know, uh, mentioned in his talk at the very outset, the, the CDC uh, with Kamara Jones's work and others, you know, was, was already doing that, has been doing that kind of thing for decades, but NIH has not. There's been tremendous resistance over the decades um, within the NIH, but I think that some of that resistance has, has lessened. And I also think that the study sections uh, will be much more open-minded uh, to look favorably upon grant applications uh, from investigators who are seeking R01 funding uh, to begin to push the envelope a little bit more, you know, uh, unpack this, unpack this issue of race, because there's been resistance, at least in my long career, there was res resistance on the part of study sector members, uh, many of which you know, were not particularly diverse, didn't really know where uh, the scientists of color were coming from, didn't understand their perspective and why they wanted to uh, raise certain questions. So, so, so I think that this is a process uh, you know, that is unfolding. But, but I would say that I, I think that we are we're at, a, at a critical juncture now in terms of the kinds of, the kinds of questions that we can ask, the kinds of data that will be available to us, both at the national level and in targeted community studies that will really drill down into the life experiences of specific racial and ethnic populations, especially the smaller ones, to make sure that we're asking the right, the right kinds of questions. So, that's, that's what I want to, to offer as a way of at least uh, opening up the conversation about this issue. So, so I understand you to be saying we really do need novel data collection. We, we, we're limited with what we have right now. We are terribly limited with what we have. We've, we've been severely limited. And I think that's because in large part, it's because, I mean, maybe two reasons. One, there's been resistance to incorporating certain kinds of questions in national uh, health surveys, and there's been a dearth of, um, of, of scientists of color, particularly younger scientists of color, who want to, who want to address these kinds of issues. And as, as their numbers increase, and they begin to develop their career and pursue their careers and address these burning issues, I think that, I think that we're, going to, uh, we're going to be the beneficiaries of some new kinds of insights uh, that will help us understand some of the fundamental drivers of, of racial and ethnic health disparities. Uh, so there are several different kinds of activities that we might need data for, for surveillance, for etiologic understanding, the mechanisms, the pathways by which uh, these disparities occur, and intervention, uh, studies to understand how we actually change the disparities and reduce those disparities. Um, Presumably we need better data for all three of those. Do you think we have the balance about right or are some of those less developed than others? Do you mean, um, do we, can I just ask you for a clarification of your question? Yes. Do you mean the, the balance of, uh, you know, quality data within those studies on race and some of the uh, other um, variables that we've been talking about today, 
related to those pathways? Um, oh, yeah, both the, the quality of the data that we have available for each of those three tasks and also the, the effort that we expend in all of those three tasks. You know, the, the amount of data that we collect, the amount of researchers who are dedicated to surveillance versus etiology versus intervention. Uh, are, we, are we well balanced between these three or are there some where we need greater attention than others? Both in data collection and in research activity. I mean, I'll just quickly give you a perspective from my, 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 my very specific place, which is cognitive aging and Alzheimer's disease research, and it's uh, terribly unbalanced. Um, there's really no uh, you know, good surveillance. Um, people who work with Medicare data um, and dementia uh, outcomes, it's really scary because um, you know, some of the populations that are uh, at highest risk um, of developing dementia have the least access to medical care and are less likely to be formally diagnosed with the disease, um, with the disease that I'm studying with, with dementia. So, um, you know, the, the health and retirement study is one example where we actually have cognitive data that we can use um, for this type of, of surveillance. And then in terms of intervention, um, the clinical trials in my, um, in my field are um, uh, totally um, uh, underrepresented with respect to uh, you know, researchers with, um, uh, minorita from minoritized backgrounds, um, participants. There's been very little investment in that in, in my, in my uh, research area. So I, I guess the question that I ask when I see this and, and it links to our last discussion is who is benefiting from this missing data? Who is benefiting from you know, not having information from, from this resistance? And I think I, I agree with the characterization of it as resistance, but I'd like to flip it around um, you know, at least partly to ask who's benefiting from that. Um, and uh, I think that's helpful in understanding um, where we should go next with this, um, with our research. Thank you. Yeah, the, you raised a, an interesting idea or an interesting point, which is uh, we talked before about missing data where you have a person in your data set, but they're missing a variable. But you, rose, uh, you um, raised another issue, which is, um, uh, selected data sets where people are missing from the data set because they don't get a dementia diagnosis, or we know there are people missing from data sets because they don't get a COVID test, or we know that there are people missing from data sets for, for various reasons. So you have a kind of selection bias in the population that you're studying, which leads to other problems that Dr. Howe is quite well known for having investigated methodologically. Um, excellent. So, so, can I just so, say one thing? So oh, please, yes. Um, in terms of like the data that we have and what we need, I, mean, I think there are huge, there's a huge gap in terms of what we have and what we need. Um, just speaking in terms of my own research, so I do a lot of HRV work and over the last couple of years, specifically um, certain cohorts will have, you know, access to data in terms of, you know, discrimination, but a lot of the HIV cohorts don't, especially if they're, again, clinic-based cohorts and they're not gathering that information. And so to be able to look at that in terms of the role of discrimination um, in terms of HRV endpoints is problematic. You know, it's a, it's a struggle to do that. But I think more broadly, I think the bigger issue too is um, looking at, so discrimination is focusing on um, racism at the interpersonal level, but we also need to really be focusing on racism at the structural level and, you know, thinking about racist policies and their impacts. And I know for a long time, I didn't really think about those things because I didn't really know how to think about those things. And I, you know, in the last few years, I started thinking, look, I really need to be thinking about those things and how to do those analyses. And even what is the definition of a racist policy? And so I know that there was a paper I saw recently on Twitter that came out that has like a database of different types of racist policies that have come out in um, the last 10 years. So I just want to, um, my apologies for not remembering the names of the, the authors, but I just also wanted to thank those authors for putting that together because I think that will create really important information that we can use to move forward to look at the impacts of um, racist policies. And then also in terms of interventions, the impacts of anti-racist policies, right? And so I'm not well-versed in that either, but I'm forcing myself to collaborate with others, um, some at BU, such as uh, Julia Reifman, 
um, who is an expert in that area so that I can do that work in my space. So I think we need to um, pool resources, both you know, physical resources, mental resources to basically address that gap between what we presently have and what we need. Thank you. Um, some people wrote to ask about the collection of other kinds of data, uh, in particular data that might help to investigate within group variation as well as between group variation. Uh, some of these ideas that were raised by listeners included measurement of skin color uh, and measurement of ancestry, of, uh, um, uh, I guess through genetic markers measuring people's ancestry. Do you have feelings about the, the collection of those kinds of data and their utility? positively or negatively, if you think that that would be helpful or distracting. Well, I do know that a few years ago, uh, there was some very serious discussion about including on the US Census form a question about skin color. And that, that the real issue is not race per se, but it's really skin color. And we know from research done by, uh, by economists, uh, folks like uh, Sandy Darity, um, that um, there is um, a positive relationship uh, among African-Americans between, between uh, light skin color and income controlling for education. And at the very lightest uh, category, shall we say, of skin color. So this is, a, this is where focusing on men, not so much on women. Uh, there's really no difference in the um, median income of the, of the fairest skin men, uh, black men and white men, no difference at all in terms of their median income. So we know that skin color matters. And if that's an important social determinant of within race, in quotes, heterogeneity for certain kinds of health outcomes, uh, then we should study it. And we should study it using national level data because there could be also some important uh, regional differences um, and historical differences to kind of go back to uh, points that were made by Chanel and by, um, by Wayne. So I guess I come down on the, on the side. Yeah, I think we should be, we should be studying colorism. Yeah, really, I think so. Just do these, uh, if, oh, I'm yes. sorry, Dr. Giles, please. Yeah, I just wanted to go back to something um, that was mentioned earlier. So, you know, I think looking at skin color and examining that is really, is vitally important. You know, I also go back to the reactions to race module that Dr. Jones and colleagues at CDC developed, um, because I think what they were really, what they were trying to and what they were successful in teasing out was, you know, not just sort of how you, you uh, personally identify yourself, but how society identifies yourself and understanding the differences in that and sort of, and that was sort of behind the concept of socially assigned race, which was basically how do people um, in this country usually classify you as opposed to how you might classify yourself. And I, I think understanding that interface um, is really important. I also think, you know, being able to tease out sort of what people's experiences are, how they feel they're being treated, how that might differ by race, ethnicity. And I think that module I mentioned sort of got at a number of those questions. Um, I've got to say that module, unfortunately, was very buried away um, and really didn't get, I think, the attention that uh, it really needed or the analysis sort of at either the national level or the state of level. And I think it raises the question about sort of who benefits um, and who benefits when data get buried and don't get analyzed. Um, and so I think not only do we need to measure it, but we need to make sure that, uh, that you know, the data are accessible and that uh, people are in fact analyzing and you know, the data are getting out there. And I think, there's publication of the data, which I think is important, but I also think we need to think about sort of how do we present data and visualize data for community members so that they can see 
the data, they understand what's happening, and then we can use that data for people to move to action. Is, is there some danger in, uh, we, we talked earlier about dividing populations more finely to, to look at distinctions between different ethnic groups within a racial category, different Asian ethnic groups, different Hispanic ethnic groups, so forth. But there's a, there's a certain political power associated with having a pan-Hispanic identity or a pan-African identity. And if we start to create categories like a racially mixed category or different Hispanic categories or different Asian categories, are we actually diluting the political power of that group to advocate on behalf of the, the membership of that group? Is there, is there a tension between the specificity of our research and the political implications for dividing that group? Uh, Jay, I think it depends on who's leading the research. If, if, uh, if the research uh, on a particular um, subgroup within a, a larger racial category, if the, if, if the research is being led by, by members from that group, then I think, I think that the, the danger that you, you've raised uh, is less. But if the research, if, if that kind of research is sort of being led by people from outside those groups, then I think that there's a real danger. I think there's a real danger there. So the more, the more from the bottom up, uh, we can make that kind, of, that kind of inquiry, that kind of granular inquiry into the, you know, the lived experiences of, of different people. Because yes, I mean, the Asian American racial category, you know, is incredibly heterogeneous. Uh, the experience of the Vietnamese is radically different from the experience of Japanese Americans. I mean, incredibly different. Um, and so certain violence is, is done uh, by, by lumping them that way. Uh, but, there are, but there are certain dangers that could tend from disaggregating them uh, as well. So I think, I think maybe, maybe the, the wisest course of action you know, would be to, to have that kind of research uh, be led by, by scholars who understand uh, the cultures of those particular subgroups, the histories of those particular subgroups, and then they can have a conversation among themselves about how best to sort of um, generalize, you know, from their, their specific uh, life experiences to, you know, some uh, more summary notion of what the Asian, for example, or what the Latinx experience is uh, in the U.S. and I might say the same thing would apply to, you know, to uh, to black folks uh, in America. <laughs> black people in America are becoming an incredibly uh, much more diverse group, you know, than in recent decades. And so I think that the same principle uh, applies. So that the more conversations that can take place within group within these racial categories to identify, you know, places where things converge and places where things diverge. Um, I think the better. Thank you for that answer. Uh, we also talked in several of the, of the presentations about places that, uh, that are different from each other. Uh, we talked about uh, Jim Crow counties historically. Uh, Dr. Kyle Giles talked about a number of different neighborhoods where he said they were always the same neighborhoods that were popping up in all the analyses. Um, we, we talked about a number of the characteristics of these places in terms of violence and resources, but getting back to Dr. James' presentation about power, aren't all these factors collinear? That is, how is it possible to study the distinct pathways that lead a place to be disadvantaged when the same place is disadvantaged across all of these di different dimensions? Is, is there any way to pull these things apart and study them separately when really the same people are at the nexus of all these forces at simultaneously? I, I think that's a, a, a great, um, you know, um, point. And, uh, you know, I think that, um, you know, that's for the, um, you know, it's a, it, it's a real challenge for this kind of research. And so one of the, the things I'll, I'll double down on in terms of how we study race is that um, we need large 
longitudinal um, uh, d uh, cohorts. We need uh, data that is life course. I mean, I study the the end, uh, end <laughs> the later end of the life course. Um, and I am currently using uh, data sets that started collecting data when people were in high school. They're now um, uh, in later life. Um, this is Project Talent and High School and Beyond. They were originally educational cohorts, um, but you know now these people are uh, up, up there in age and we're studying their cognitive outcomes. These are the kind of, of data that we need to understand some of these um, forces, including neighborhood forces. Um, we know people move around a lot. We need to actually ask people where they've lived. What's every place you've ever lived? That's how we did the regard study um, uh, that I showed you in my slides, where we looked at um, uh, where they were educated and how that impacted later life health. So, I mean, I think that um, the data that came out, uh, you know, it's in, the, it's in, not in the health field, but it's um, uh, um, Raj Chetty's data where um, they're showing that, um, you know, place and race really make such a, a difference. And also this intersectionality piece where uh, while, um, you know, from certain neighborhoods, um, uh, uh, black men who were born in uh, higher or middle-class um, families that income and that that um, you know lot that um, capital declined over time, whereas that was not the case among Black women. Um, so I think you know the those kinds of, of of resources where administrative data can be paired with health outcome data, um, it is is probably where we need to go to address um, partly address your challenge. Thank you. I'll keep my comments really quick, but I also think as we think about interventions, I think part of what we need to begin thinking about is sort of what are these structural factors that lead communities to be so concentrated in terms of poverty, uh, et cetera, and sort of thinking about sort of how do we dismantle those structures? And what I think is um, particularly illuminating is thinking about sort of how can we use data and information to equip community members so they understand the impact that's happening in their community and then have a conversation and, uh, and implement policies that dismantle those policies. And I think to me, that is sort of the power of all of this work is thinking about sort of how do we dismantle those structures, you know, whether it's as a community, city, state, or nation. And to me, that that's the power of this work. Thank you. Uh, we only have about four more minutes uh, to have this conversation, but uh, let me try to hit a few more of the audience questions. So some people ask questions about issues like uh, race-specific medicine, and other um, uh, differential treatment, uh, intentional differential treatment for different groups on the argument that they have different needs. Uh, this might involve um, something like screening different groups at different ages because uh, maybe black men have higher risk for prostate cancer at a younger age, so they should be screened sooner, but also very controversial issues like the role of race in the estimated GFR equation for, for uh, kidney function. So are, are we, in our attention to race, are we, are we doing more harm or more good? You know, the, the United States is kind of uniquely focused on race in biomedical research and practice and medical practice. Um, it, it has a, a, a unique um, saliency in, in American history because of the history of racism uh, and, and slavery. Uh, are, are we, um, are, are these, uh, different aspects of the focus on race in, in medical research and medical practice doing more harm or more good? No one wants to take that one. I'll say, so, I mean, I think that we all need to just be a little bit more nuanced and realize that, yes, yeah, so race is socially constructed. It represents hierarchy of privilege, right? And so I think that 
we need to, you can use it in medicine. Um, I mean, I'm not a doctor, an MD, but I think if you are gonna use it, like you have to have that historical perspective and that race may be serving for a marker or a proxy for something else and not automatically just think it is due to genetics and you know biological determinism, right? And so if you go in it with that lens, then I think it's less problematic than if you are saying this is all about genetics and nothing about social context, nothing about history. Yeah, I think it's, I think it boils down to the relationship. If we're talking about clinical medicine, I'd be very interested to hear what Dr. Giles has to say. Um, but I, for me, it, it really boils down to the relationship uh, and, sp and spending quality time and getting, and, and the healthcare provider really getting to know uh, the patient, um, the care seeker, getting to know what that individual is bringing into, into the clinic, into that doctor-patient relationship and making the best use of the 10 or 15 minutes you know, that, that the doctor might have uh, with that patient, of course. And we could also, you know, we don't have time, but we could talk about the kinds of, of uh, perverse incentives <laughs> you know, that <laughs> operate uh, within, the healthcare, within the US healthcare system and incredibly perverse incentives which I think uh, redound to the, uh, to the disadvantage uh, of people of color, even when, even when we have uh, health insurance. Thank you for that response. Uh, I, have, I see that Dr. Galea has reappeared and it's 5.58 Eastern time. And so I fear that we may be at the end of our opportunity to discuss this in this panel today. Well, uh it is always my role to stop good conversations and stop anybody from having fun. It is a, I learned that when I became Dean. Um, what a privilege it is to listen to this conversation. I, I've been monitoring the, um, the chat where people are talking to each other, uh, participants, and there are comments like panelists are an inspiration. This is brilliant. Thank you all for the work you're doing. Great discussion. I, I, I couldn't echo it um, more. I, I thought this was an enormously, enormously interesting conversation. It could have gone on for hours. With the presentations, I thought, were were clear and advanced my, my thinking. I, I just feel like I learned tremendously in the past hour and a half and I'm deeply grateful to all of you. I'm always grateful to all our presenters, our moderators and to our audience, recognizing that everybody is busy and uh, it has, feels like the past year has gone um, like extraordinarily fast or extraordinarily slowly. I can't tell which one it is, but it's moments like this where I feel like we are learning, taking the opportunity that the, this year presents to think about how we do things better that uh, in some respects give me hope. I thought uh, Professor James um, uh, made this point, which I just want to end on, which is there is a moment of opportunity. I think Sherman, you said this, there's a moment of opportunity. And I um, I couldn't agree more. I, uh, and I think it is because there's a moment of opportunity that we should be having this conversation. So thank you. Thank you everybody for participating in this. This is one, uh, the first third of a three-part symposium um, uh, tomorrow. The second part is at 10 a.m. Eastern. Uh, please uh, join us then. Once again, thank you to our panelists. Thank you to our moderator. And thank you to everybody in the audience. Everybody have a good